glorious power for your presence, for your life and love that you've given to us. Oh, Hashem, may the expressions of my mouth, the thoughts of my heart be pleasing before you, my rock, my Savior, my Redeemer, my shield. May it be your will, Adonai, that this teaching today would bring joy and light and freedom and life and excitement to all who hears it. May it refresh every soul and may it bring physical healing as we hear Your Word because Your Word brings health to our bones. We bless You, Hashem. May Your name forever be praised. B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. Baruch Hashem, Soul Food 3. This has been a... Uh, I did not intend for this to be a three-part series. But Hashem knows better, and I pray that it's been a joy to everyone, and uh, everyone's been out these last couple of weeks, I pray, shopping and buying and, and, and looking for those kosher uh, hexures, as we call them, the kosher seals. Uh, if you're not sure what to look for as far as seals go, uh, the most common is the OU. I'd say most common. It's very common where we are, anyway. And, and in case you're wondering, wow, is kosher expensive? They have OU certification on almost all of the great value brand stuff. So the answer is no, it's not. It's not at all. Um, and on that note, I just want to share this with you uh, because that is a, a, a misnomer, I believe, that many people think that eating kosher is vastly more expensive. It is not more expensive. It is not vastly more expensive. It's, a, it's maybe a few cents more per pound on ground hamburger meat. But then again, you're actually getting meat. <laughs> Some of y'all will catch that in a second. He said, well, non-kosher hamburger is $6 a pound and kosher hamburger is six thirty three a pound. Yes, but this is meat of a kosher animal. This is, we're not sure. All right? If you don't know what I'm talking about, just Google it. Pink slime. And just go from there. Woo! Want a hamburger now? What is pink slime? What is it exactly? Right? Now, chicken is more expensive. But why? Why is, chicken, why is kosher chicken more expensive? Because the chicken has to live longer. It has to be cared for differently. It has to be processed differently. A non-kosher chicken lives, my wife knows the answer to this, I'm not going to speak to how many weeks, but roughly half the time of a regular chicken. And it takes 45 minutes from start to finish to process a non-kosher chicken. It takes three hours to process a kosher one. So you do the math. When you go and, and get a kosher fried chicken, it is different. Last night, my wife and I, we are, uh, we've had a, a busy week, Baruch Hashem, and so our Shabbos meal was pre prepared, prepared. And so we got one of those kosher uh, rotisserie chickens, and I mean, it's, there's a difference, okay? You, you get the, the non-kosher chicken, and you put the little thing in there, and you're boiling it because there's so much water. So anyway, the point is, that's why it's more expensive. It's probably too much information, but anything else, everything else, kosher oranges are the same price as regular oranges. Some of you are going, wait a minute. Baruch Hashem. There's lots that we could say as far as the practical things about kashrut. But I want to continue to talk about the spiritual aspects of it and give us a greater understanding, hopefully, uh, of why we do what we do. What's, what's really the big deal about food anyway? As we're getting into Soul Food 3, and we're wondering why, why three Shabbats talking about food? What is the big deal? I mentioned on the first, the first uh, message that... The first commandment that we had from Hashem, the first commandment ever was about what we could and couldn't eat. Now think about that for a second. The God of the universe has placed man in the garden. He didn't say, now don't kill anybody or anything. And by the way, there's a, there's a blessing on, on, on Arab Shabbos that says... Uh, Hashem bless me, my house, and all of, all of the creatures, my covenant members. So in Judaism, we have respect for the animal kingdom because God has a covenant with them as well. 
the rainbow, the Noah's Ark. That was, there, was, who, there was animals on the boat with us. I say us because all of us were in the, in the, the loins, so to speak, of Noah. But we're not on the boat by ourselves. There's all the animals there too. So we talk about kosher slaughter. We have permission from Hashem to eat certain animals, not any animal, but certain animals. We have to do it in a specific way to, to slaughter them in a specific way that brings the least amount. If In fact, they say there's no pain involved in that particular slaughter and no trauma or any of that type of thing. And why? Because God says, listen, these are my creatures too, and they're your fellow covenant members. And my dogs say, Amen. <laughs> we we wash our hands and there's a before you see the baraka over the bread, and our dogs are sitting there. <laughs> and I say and they say, Amen. <laughs> and they all start saying, Now the Hala. The only thing is, is that when we light the Chavdala candle and we do that, and there's no Hala normally, but they's like, Hey, you spoke Hebrew and lit a candle. We need some bread. <laughs> and when I say, What are y'all doing? They pull the even the dogs get the crumbs from the master's table. Look, they're very, very, very gifted in the knowledge of the scriptures, right? That's because they're covenant members. So what's the big deal about food? Why, why, what's, you know, Hashem tells the man on the garden, don't, he didn't say don't kill anything. He didn't say don't lie and cheat. He didn't say don't commit adultery. The first thing he said is, you can, you can have anything you, you want to eat except for don't eat that. And what happened? The man, the woman showed up and he told his wife what Hashem had said. And evidently, Adam told his wife, don't even touch it. He gave her a fence law. Like, we're not, don't even touch it. So the serpent shows up and he says, did God really say? Just like that. The serpent was part French. Did God really say? Okay. And she says, we're not supposed to eat it. We're not even supposed to touch it. And so what happens? The woman eats the, eats the, the forbidden food, the fruit. The man walks over there and he could have, Adam could have been the redeemer right there. Because Adam could have looked at his wife and said, Ma! Tov, Lotov. Tov, Ra. He could have interceded for his wife and wiped out the sin. But instead, he said, give me some of that. This is why we must choose good, good wives, Right? This is why the Esh Hayil, a good wife, who can find, right? And wives, you must choose a good husband. Somebody who's going to, you know, you need to both say to each other, don't do this. So it's really Adam's fault because he had the commandment directly from Hashem. He, you know, he can't go up there and say this, you know, Adam tried to, he said, this woman that you gave me, and Hashem says, no, 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 Adam, I was talking to you. You and I were talking. I told you. Then I gave you the woman. And you told the woman, which is good. And you said, don't touch it. And I said, oh, I didn't say that. That's good. And then your woman ate. And you ate too. And I'm like, Adam. <laughs> and because they broke that mitzvah, think about this. Because they broke the mitzvah of eating something they weren't supposed to eat, because of that, we have death. We have sin in the world, and women have pain in childbirth because of that. So as I said before, ladies, the next time your husband says, whatever, and picks up that pork chop, slap him across the mouth and say, you're not going to do that to me again. <laughs> so what's the big deal about food? How often do we eat? We eat a lot. And we eat often, right? So it's a part of our daily lives many times a day. My wife, you know, sometimes she, we're so busy and she's so busy, my wife can go without food because she just is like this little machine. And then 
and because of that, I'm off, I'm off to say, what's for breakfast, what's for lunch, what's for, what are you doing for dinner? And then she, she looks at me and says, is that all you think about? <laughs> I say, well, I mean, I'm a man. And so, what do we, we have food at parties, we have food at weddings, we have food at funerals, we have food during our holidays, food our daily lives, every day, just as something we got to do to continue to put fuel in our body, we need food to live. If you don't have you, if you, you're fasting or something happens or you, you skip a meal, suddenly you can't think, you know, you're all like fuzzy. You know, we, we were, my wife and I were moving a bunch had a long time between meals, and we, we both got something to eat right quick, and we said, oh gosh, we feel better, now we can keep going. But then there's weddings and funerals and holidays, and what is it, I mean, we talk about a wedding, what's the first thing? The food, the reception, what's for dinner? We're going to have people over, we're going to have guests over, and so we say, uh, okay, hey, y'all want to come over? Listen, when you invite friends over to the house, you'll say, just come over to the house. And not not at my house anyway. And I don't even think about it, you know, we're driving, or I say, somebody's coming over, so-and-so is coming over just to visit or whatever. And my wife said, we've got to go to the store and get something. Why? Why do you have to shove a pastry down their face when they come in the door? <laughs> you know, you walk into my house like, shalom, want a pastry, coffee, tea, milk, soda, something, wine, wine, right? You've got to eat something. My wife says, I don't feel good. I'll fix you chicken soup. See, you're always eating everything. <laughs> Courtship. We think about if we want to take this young lady out. We want to meet her. So what do we say? Would you like to go to dinner with me? What did James say? You want to go get a coffee? Right? That's how it all began, with coffee. So food is a part of who we are. It's, it, it, it's, it's, it, it even changes our mood. You know, he, James, I'm going to pick on James who's getting married tomorrow. <laughs> he wanted to get a coffee. He took her to some, you know, I don't know where they went, but they went to some coffee house, you know, got there. <laughs> Hello? You're the one I'm looking for. I can see it in your eyes. Would you like a tall cappuccino? <laughs> right? Yeah, I performed that once, but only once. But he didn't say, hey, want to get some popcorn? Hot dog? I mean, listen, there's a, there's a, a type of food with well, it's romantic, right? Cappuccino is romantic, hot dog, not so much. <laughs> and so food changes our, our mood. You have a woman, the, 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 the not kryptonite, it's the opposite of kryptonite, but if you want to make your, your wife happy, get her chocolate. It's like a magic pill. I don't feel good. I got you chocolate. You're a bad husband, I got you chocolate. You're a great husband, muzzle tov, fine. You're going to have that like a, we have our, we have our CHL for carrying weapons and we have chocolate. Virgushim. It affects our mood. In fact, I want to read this to you. This is a, uh, a, a doctor who's a nutritionist, Mer Mercola, and he writes the following. It is widely known that your mood can trigger food cravings, cause you to overeat or it can kill your appetite entirely. But the opposite also holds true, and that food you eat can make or break your mood. This is apparent not only in the minutes after you've eaten, but also over time, as your diet helps to shape your mental health from the inside out. He continues to say, I simply cannot overstate the importance of your food choices when it comes to your mental health. In a very real sense, you have two brains. One in your head and one in your stomach. Both of which, now get this, both of which are during fetal development. Did you just get that? 
It was almost like we were created or something by a divine being. Hashem used the same construction material to make our brain as He did to make our stomach. And this is why He says, this is why I want you to eat certain things. Because your brain and your stomach are the same material and therefore in order to affect your brain and affect your mood, I need you to eat this spiritual stuff. And if you eat that other stuff, it's going to affect you the wrong way. These two systems, the doctor continues, are connected via your vagus nerve, the tenth cranial nerve that runs from your brain stem down to your abdomen. It is now well established that this vagus nerve is the primary route your gut bacteria uses to transmit Maintaining optimal stomach health or gut health is therefore paramount when trying to address your mental state. Now think about that for a second. Now what is mood and mental state? What does that have to do with spiritual things? Because your mood is part of your soul. So we're talking about, your, we're talking about soul food here. We're talking about how eating unkosher food can negatively impact your soul. We wonder why does God care about what we eat? But we go back to the very beginning and we see that food is intrinsically connected with spirituality, good or bad. And we've been taught that God doesn't care what we eat. That it doesn't have any bearing on our spiritual nature. Yet, the God of all spirits told us what to eat or not to eat. And yet, we dismiss it like it doesn't matter. And science, all these many thousands of years later, science find, we find out that our brain, where all of our thoughts, where do we have Amuna in our brain? Where do we, where do we learn Torah in our brain? What do we, we fight anger and we embrace joy in our brain. And God says, I want you to put certain food here. It's interesting to find that those foods that pr provide a positive influence on us are kosher foods. Chocolate is kosher. It changes your wife's mood for the better. <laughs> Baruch Hashem. Wine is kosher. Oh, man. Brisket is kosher. Mm. Chicken fried chicken is kosher. As long as you don't use milk. But it's good. <laughs> what is food anyway to a Jewish person? Let's talk about this uh, also from the standpoint of people say that when Yeshua came, He made all food clean. Did you know that that's not actually in the Scripture? It's not there. That is what's called... It's, I'm, I'm referring to Mark chapter 7 primarily. And there in parentheses, in a lot of translations, in parentheses it'll say, Yeshua made all things, all food clean. But that phrase is not in the text. It's what's called a parenthetical statement. Meaning that the translators interpreted what Yeshua said to mean that. But if you go back to the... We don't really have an original copy, but if you go back to the Greek, that doesn't exist. That phrase, Yeshua made all foods clean, is not there. The King James Version of the Bible gets a, a bad rap a lot of times, but if you go to the King James, the one that Paul and Silas had... <laughs> That's what I saw. <laughs> You'll notice that that phrase is not there. It's because it doesn't exist. It's a parenthetical statement. But let's think about this for a second. If, if I was talking to you and I said, I want you to come over to my house and we're going to eat some food. I was talking to, to Rayford or something. I said, come on, Rayford, come over to my house. We're going to eat some food. And let's pretend for a moment that Shalom. I wasn't Jewish, and he's not Jewish, but he's going to come to my house. If we're just two guys in America, here in, in, in Texas, and I said, come to my house, we're going to eat some food, he is, he's thinking a lot of possibilities, but probably not on his mind would be buzzard, or fried scorpion, or uh, 
python uh, shoulder back. <laughs> or uh, rats or squirrel short ribs. Those things, they just feel like an appetizer. Cat. He's probably not thinking cat. Somebody said cat. He's probably not thinking cat. So none of that is food in his brain. He's probably thinking something else, but not that, right? There's things that's not food. Let me ask you a question. So I come over here to Colleen's sweet lady and I say, Colleen, I got good news for you. The Messiah has come. She's like, praise Hashem. And he's come and set you free so that you can have rodent to eat. Now to her, that's not good news. <laughs> I just saw on her face, and she's like, ooh, that's not what I was looking for. I was thinking salvation, but you said rodent, and I'm, just, I'm out on that. Here's the point. Swine is not food to a Jew. Snake is not food to a Jew. Catfish is not food to a Jew. So anytime you're reading in the Bird of the Shot, it talks about that all food is clean. The operative word there is Food. Right? What is food to Jewish people? Herring is food. Right? Mahi mahi is food. Brisket is food. Chicken is food. But rat and snake and swine, not food. So when it says he's made, even if he did say what you didn't say, if he said he made all food clean, the, answer, the question is food. So food is kosher things, and everything that's not kosher is not food. Dogs aren't food, and my dog said amen to that. So let's prove for a second that food is, is spiritual. Let's turn to, the, to the, the book of Acts, chapter 15. We'll be spending some time in the Brit Hadashah today, uh, a little bit of time anyway. The book of Acts, chapter 15, I want to show you something. Again, there's people out there that would debate this topic and say, God doesn't care about food. Hopefully, we've, we've crushed, destroyed, liberated, annihilated, burned up most of those ideas. But I want to show you something that, that ought to be stunning if you take time to just pause and think about it. We're talking here about the fact that there can be things that we eat that have a positive on our spirit because food is just not mundane. Many, many people who are listening to me today on online, listen to me later, would say that's just God just doesn't care. And yet we have this. It says in verse 9, we'll begin verse, in ver, reading rather in verse 19, it says, It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles, those from the nations, who are turning to God. Okay? Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain. Say abstain. Amen. Abstain from food. Say food. Amen. Polluted. Say polluted. Amen. By idols. See, I like to read stuff in slow motion. Because sometimes we read through things and we just, you know, when food to us means something different, food means anything that you can buy at the grocery store. But these are Jewish people writing this. And they're saying abstain from all food. Operative word. Food. But it, forgetting that for a second, it says polluted by idols. Okay. If you're not quite catching it, this is food that has been spiritually polluted by an idol. The idol didn't like get coos on it and now it's no good. Now it has botulism. That's not what it's talking about. It's a spiritual pollution. Well, if we believe that the apostles were accurate in their assessment, then it completely destroys the idea that food has no intrinsic spiritual nature. Do you get that? 
Because now if we agree that the, the apostles are not liars, that they actually are looking out for us and they're being led by the Spirit, and they say to us, abstain from food that has been spiritually polluted by an idol, then we must admit that food has in and of itself an intrinsic spiritual ability. And therefore, we've got to identify which food is spiritually good and which food is spiritually bad. That's what we're talking about here. So therefore, when we go to the store and we begin to buy things, we're on a spiritual journey. We are taking spiritual fuel to put, in, to put into the spiritual body. Last week we gave an example of a Maserati. Taking Maserati fuel to put into the Maserati machine. Which was my nickname in college. But I want to draw your attention also to verse 21 of this statement. Because many of us in this room are living out this, pro this seemingly prophetic word. So let's, let's go back, in fact, let's go back and fin from 19 and we'll read through 21. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Notice the word there, by the way, just want to read in slow motion again, difficult. The idea was that if you come into a place like Sar Shalom and we meet you at the door and say, Welcome! You're being led here by the Spirit of God? Yes, that's awesome! We'd like to introduce you to our halacha! What's halakha, you ask? That's got to be your first question, right? Halakha is the way that you walk. It's the way that you carry out the commandments of God. You don't even know about the commandments of God yet. You've never even heard of the Torah. That's awesome. So we're going to tell you how to do this thing you've never even heard of. And so before you come into the building, we need to put on some zizi and get you a keeper. We need to talk about kosher eating. We need to talk about, you know, uh, marital relationship. We need to talk about this. We talk about zinut and modest dress and all these kind of things. And you're standing at the door. <laughs> and then you walk back to your car and you get in the car and you drive away. These people are nuts. So the idea was, is look, Hashem accepts them. Obviously, they're being led by the Spirit. So let them come on in. And we just got four things to tell them to do. Because all four things have to do with idolatry. So you've got to stop worshiping idols. That's number one. And here's the idol stuff. Don't eat food that's been spiritually polluted by an idol. Stay away from, you know, wrong relationships. Don't eat unkosher, slaughtered animals. And, and, and don't... Uh, What's the fourth thing? What's that? No, blood. Don't drink blood. Right? Those are all idolatry stuff. Other than that, come in. Welcome. Now, there's this thing called the Torah. We won't tell you, tell you about it. Never heard of it. I know, because you grew up in Rome or Ephesus, or you grew up in some far you know, place like Great Britain, and you, you know, last week you had blue face paint on your face, and you were saying, Freedom! Right? Right? You're on the horseback and then somebody you met and you saw the Torah and you saw you met Yeshua and all of a sudden you're set free. And now you want to know what it's, what it's all about. So come on in. And why? Because verse 21 says, For Moshe has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read where? The synagogues on every Sabbath. In other words, there's people here today who have only been coming for a few weeks or maybe a few months. They didn't know anything about anything. They just came because God is drawing them. And they're sitting here today hearing Moshe being taught and they're going, awesome. Okay, diet change. That's cool. Right? And a few weeks down the road, a few months down the road, something else will be taught. And they'll, they'll okay, word of God, Baruch Hashem, got that. All right, I'm doing the Baruch Hashem thing. Listen. <laughs> the father of the bride started coming to Sar Shalom, and everybody was saying Shabbat Shalom, and, and he said something like Yabba Dabba Ding Dong when he was replying to people. <laughs> He's like, whatever. Whatever. 
<laughs> you know, they're so sweet. They came for Rosh Hashanah and then like uh, basically, yeah, a couple weeks later, we're in the middle of Sukkot and they come out to, I forget where we were for Sukkot, and somebody hands them a palm frond and a, and a citron and they just start dancing with it. And the family like, what are we doing? I don't know. Years ago, the similar thing happened to another family. They showed up and the husband saw us dancing around with the palm frond and the citron and they walked out of there and the husband said to the wife, these people are a cult. They are, this is totally messed up. I mean, they're just dancing around with, with, with palm branches and citrons and everything. He went home and he started to open his Bible. He says, I'm going to prove to you, honey, where these people are cultish. And all of a sudden he found in the Word of God, you shall celebrate with a palm frond and a citron. And he went, well, maybe they got something I don't know. <laughs> so the Moshe is read every week and people are going to get it. Now, Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. To remind ourselves something once again. Romans chapter 7 beginning in verse 12. Romans 7, 12. It says, so then... The Torah is holy, and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Now ask yourself for a moment, if you're still struggling with the concept of whether or not one should do the law of God or not, this whole law of God thing. Because when we say Moses, by the way, let me, let me say something, because I say Moses and people don't know and they don't understand. They think I'm teaching or that they were teaching or anybody in a synagogue is teaching the law of man. Because Moses is preached, it sounds like, well, Moses is being preached, but what about God? Well, Moses is a euphemism for God. Because Moses went to God and said, what's your word? And God said, here it is. And he took it to the people. And so it's called the law of Moses, but it's really the word of God. Because God said, do this. There's really, in the whole Bible, the Torah, there's no man laws in there. There's no, like, God, you know, Moses was like, you know, I think we shouldn't have bacon. That's good. <laughs> no, he didn't say that. God says, you shouldn't have bacon. He said, okay. And by the way, notice the doctor said that the same material makes up our brain, makes up our stomach. And so people said, you know, you're thinking with your stomach, right? There's a scripture verse that says, don't let your stomach be your God. So I have people, I've had many people, through, not many, I shouldn't say that, not many, but I've had people through the years, when I've taught on Kashrut, you know, this one guy in particular I'm thinking of, came down front one time and was chatting after the service, and he, we, he literally went through every single Brit Hadasha passage, uh, the letters of Shaul, letters of Paul, and, and Acts 10 and so on, and it was like a skeet shoot. He'd throw it up, and I'd, ch -ch -ch boom, you know, I'd answer it, give him all the resources, get the history. I mean, we spent like half an hour down here, not here, literally, but, and we did do those, and when it came to everything, every single passage he could think of, and he, there was a scriptural, historical, cultural answer for every single one of them. There he is, Baruch Hashem. When it came down to it, he says, well, I just like, I just like the, the taste of, of, of bacon. Ignore that. <laughs> and so I said to him, don't let your stomach be your God. Because really, there are, there are honest doubters and there are dishonest doubters. There are people who have heard things that I used to teach many, many years ago, unfortunately, who come and say, well, what about this, this, and this? And they honestly want to know because they're just confused and they, they just want to get it right. And they just want to know. And, and they're a little confused. And once you bring it, the light to it and show them, and show them where it kind of got skewed a little bit, then, then all of a sudden they're like, oh, nope, wow, okay, cool, got right on. Then there's others who they want to find a loophole to keep eating what they're eating. And they're just trying to, they're throwing everything out of the book. What about that? What about that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? And they don't really want the truth. They're just looking for an opportunity to keep going to the place to get the bacon cheeseburger. That's all they're interested in. And that's why when you get down to it, they say, 
I just like the taste of it, man. Okay. So he continued to say, Did that which is good then become death to me? The answer is no. He answers his own question. By no means. Which is an emphatic way to say no in that culture. But in order that Torah breaking, that's what sin is, in order that law breaking or Torah breaking might be recognized as Torah breaking, it produced death in me through what was good so that through the commandment Torah breaking might become utterly Torah breaking a full. But he says in verse 14 something crucial for us to understand. We know that the law, that is the Torah, is spiritual. All of it is spiritual. Not just the have faith, not just the cast out demons part. All of it is spiritual, including this is what you should eat and what you shouldn't eat. When you choose to eat versus non-kosher chicken, you are making a spiritual choice. And you are therefore affecting your soul. Someone said to me, and a man asked me, is eating non-kosher food a sin? My reply would be simply this, what is sin? The answer to that question is sin is breaking the commandments. Did God command us to eat certain things? The answer, of course, is yes. If we choose to disobey that commandment, is that breaking the commandment? Yes. Is breaking commandment a sin? Yes, you have the answer to your question. It makes us feel uncomfortable because we want to do whatever we want to do and blame somebody else for the consequences. All of that in our society today, I'm having trouble thinking of them, but they do exist. Let's turn quickly to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I've got to get all of this good information into this episode because there won't be a Soul Food 4. We've learned that you should never go beyond a trilogy when you're doing sequels. Rocky learned that. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 10 begins by saying, For I don't want you to become ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud and they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized in the Moshe and the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food. That's the manna. And they all drank from the same spiritual drink. That was the rock that was flowing the water out. And that rock was Messiah. And that rock accompanied them in the desert. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. Okay, quickly, what is this teaching us? It's the very same gospel. What the apostle is saying here in his letter is that our forefathers in the desert ate the same, not a different, they ate the same spiritual food and they drank the same spiritual water which was the rock that followed them around the desert. There is a tradition in Judaism that there was one giant rock that literally followed our people around the desert and that's where the rivers of living water came from. And that rock was Messiah according to both Jewish tradition and the apostles. And what the apostles are saying here is, is they're, they're drinking the same water and eating the same food. The problem is they just didn't have faith. It's not a different gospel. There's a different gospel in the Bible. Did you know that? It's not there. It's the same myth like Paul, that God changed Paul's name to Paul. Did you know that there's nowhere in the Bible that says that God changed Saul's name to Paul? Do you know there's no place that says that? Nowhere. Anywhere. It's a myth. It's one of the things that's taught. And nobody researches. Nobody fact checks it. It's like MSNBC. <laughs> I just, just kidding. I just... It says, continue on, I want to draw, I'm drawing a, a parallel here, John, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 5. First of all, let's also look at, before we get to the, go further, look at 1 Corinthians 9, 26 and 27. Right before, because...
I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No. I beat my body. I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. I beat my body. In other words, what Shaul is saying is body into spiritual submission. My body just can't have whatever it wants to eat. My body would like to have, my flesh, my carnal nature would like to have non-kosher seafood gumbo. And there were times, because I was raised that way, I was raised with all that mess. There are times when I will see an advertisement or something and my flesh will say, boy, that would sound good. And my spirit has to say, shut up. Right? There are times when my, when my carnal nature would say, look, you're hungry. Just stop there at that barbecue house and get something to eat. And my spirit has to say, shut up. Because I beat my carnal flesh into submission just like the, the apostle is talking about. And what we're going to find out is 1 Corinthians 10 is talking about food ultimately. So he's, he goes to talk about a spiritual concept to bring it back to a spiritual concept. So he says in verse 1 of chapter 10, For I do not want you to be ignorant. In other words, it's a continuing thought. I'm beating my body into submission because here's why. Now, got to hurry. Verse 6 through 7 says, Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things. The word evil is the Hebrew ra. It means evil, bad, wicked. Ra literally means those things that are opposed to the law of God. Any, I, any wonder then why Pharaoh was supposed to be the son of Ra? The antithesis to Hashem was Pharaoh. So, in verse 7 it says, Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan revelry. What preceded the pagan revelry? Eat in food and drink. In other words, what they had to eat was not kosher, wasn't what God had prescribed, and it led, what they put in their belly, changed their mood to want to go do pagan revelry. You say, oh, that's ridiculous, Rabbi. Is it? Don't eat of the tree of good knowledge of good and evil. At least you die. Everything else will keep you on the right path. This will take you off the path. What? Everything else here will keep you on the path if you eat it, but this won't. Got to keep going. Verse 14 through 18 says, Therefore, my dear friends, flee from what? Idolatry. It's about to get illumination right here in a second. I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourself what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we have thanks a participation in the blood of Messiah? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Messiah? Because there is one loaf, we who are many of one body, for we all partake of one loaf. Consider the people of Israel. Do those who eat the sacrifice participate in the altar? Whoa, about to get put on your gog, your whatever, your mask. <sighs> Going deeper. See, most people don't realize that a sin offering was an edible offering. That when you offered the sin offering, you partook, you, you offered some of it on the altar and went up in the fire, but the other portion of it you ate. And you had to eat it in a sanctified place, which was the city limits of Jerusalem, and you invited the priests and the Levites and some of your friends to eat with you. In other words, the one who was the sinner who offered up the sin offering and the priest who offered the offering eat the same sacrifice. Therefore, that which you offered up, who was innocent on your behalf, you now eat the innocence and therefore become innocent. That's part of the redeeming factor. This is why Yeshua said, I'm offering myself up from you, but it doesn't stop there. You've got to consume me so that I will become you and you will become me. And I'm going to eat of the same sacrifice, even though I'm not a sinner, because I'm the one offering the sacrifice. Food is deeply spiritual.
This is why you don't want to eat of the swine flesh. Why? Because Satan, cursed be he, offers the swine on the altar. And what this is saying is, don't you understand that when Israel eats of the sacrifices, they are partaking of the altar itself. What's the altar? The altar is Hashem. The altar is Mashiach. The altar is the temple. In other words, when you eat the sacrifice, you are eating the temple. And therefore, when you eat those things that are not kosher, you're eating of the dark temple. But he continues. Do I mean that the sacrifice offered to an idol is anything? Or that an idol is anything? In other words, he's just saying they're not really God. But what are they? No. But the sacrifices are pagans of pagans are offered to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to be particip participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of Hashem and the cup of demons too. You cannot drink the table of demons. Man, I wish I had another hour. See, when you sit down at home to eat, that's an altar. You know why it's an altar? Because something is being sacrificed that you might live. And everybody's gathered around the table. And what's the first thing you do? Hashem, we thank you for this food that you provided us. We bless you for its provision. You eat of it and your body gets renewed and you continue living. Something gave its life. Even if it was a piece of broccoli, it gave its life that you could live. And after you get done, you say more brakas and you bless the Lord and you sing songs and you give Him thanks. But when you put something unkosher on that table, it now becomes a table of idolatry. Rabbi, that's, that's harsh. Unkosher food, according to the scripture, is detestable. And the word detestable is sheketz. And the word sheketz means idolatry. We can't take unkosher food and put it on a spiritual table. Hasatan Kirsby, he took an unkosher swine. Swine can't be kosher, but you know what I mean. And put it on the altar of God. He was mocking God when he did that. It has to be pure. This is why the apostle writes, don't even think about sexual immorality. We're not permitted to even think about these types of things. This is why Messiah said, don't, even, don't think that I came to do away with the commandments. We're not even permitted to even think that. I tell people that it's very simple. Some people say, well, the apostle Paul came and he taught that the Torah is done away with. These commandments don't matter anymore. And I said, I don't think this. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I will argue with you. I've already staked my claim on what I believe about the Apostle Paul. I believe that he was a good apostle who's been misunderstood. But let's just suppose for a moment that what you say is correct. If it were true, if somebody were able to convince me beyond a reasonable doubt that the Apostle Paul actually did teach that the commandments of God are done away with, then according to De Devarim 13, Deuteronomy 13, and according to 1 John 2, he's a false apostle. And Hasva Shalom, may it not be so, but if somebody convinced me beyond a reasonable doubt that Messiah himself came and taught against the, the, the commandments, we can eat whatever we want, it doesn't matter. If somebody were to be able to convince me with that, which they can't, but suppose they did. That Hasve Shalom, he's not the Messiah. But not for me, I'm not Jewish. If the commandments are for just, are not for everyone, then they're for no one. Messiah himself said, I'm going to be one shepherd and I'll have one flock and I'll bring people that don't yet belong to this flock and bring them here. The, the apostle goes on to say, everything is permissible but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible but not everything is constructive. Nobody should seek his own good but the good of others. He says in verse 25, eat anything sold in the meat market without raising question of conscience for the earth is out of eyes and everything in it. If some unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go eat whatever he's put before you without raising question of conscience, 
Now many people think that he's talking about whatever is put before you. But that's not true. Any better and they sit a pork roast in front of you, you just very politely and very lovingly say, it's pork, I don't eat pork. I'm Jewish and God says no. Do you have an apple? <laughs> you can do it very lovingly, very kindly, and very respectfully. Most of the time they'll say, I'm so sorry. Didn't know. It's okay. I'm gluten free too. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Send that for Hodiah's benefit. The video she sent me is funny. He's here talking about food. How do we know that? He says, do this for the other man's conscience. Uh, don't raise questions. He says in verse 28, but if anyone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it. So the issue here that he's talking about is it's kosher or not. That's the point. I want to take us somewhere right quick before we conclude today's topic. Daniel chapter 1. I may do an online version of Soul Food 4 because we still haven't got to, to kosher utensils. <sighs> Baruch Hashem. This week I'll do a video in my office. His kingdom, and there they're going to be trained. They're going to they're going to become they're going to become emissaries. They're going to become wise men. And many people would agree that Daniel is a powerful guy. Even in Jew, I mean, Jewish, he's a hero. I mean, Daniel in the lions den. The lions don't eat him. I mean, he merits a lot of incredible power. And in this, whole, what could we say about Daniel? In another part of the story, we learn that he prays three times towards Jerusalem. Okay, Daniel, he's an intercessor. Okay, that's good. That's spiritual. People would say, Daniel, he prayed three times. He's an intercessor. Maybe there's other things we could say about Daniel. Maybe he was very righteous with his tongue. He spoke no evil speech. He, did, he wasn't a liar. His truth was in him. But that's not how the story begins. Verse 8, it says something phenomenal about Daniel and his friends. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. Now, anytime you have wine mentioned when it's talking about food in Jewish culture, this happens in the Brit Shah, you know it's not talking about kosher. Because wine is not unkosher per se. It can be unkosher if it's produced by pagans because pagans pour out the wine as an offering, much like they do they cook the food. So Jewish people won't eat non-kosher wine, not because wine in and of itself is unkosher, like grapes are kosher, but they'll want kosher certified wine, which ensures that it wasn't offered up to a demon. That's why. So what Daniel and his friends are saying here is that we don't want any of that food, especially meat and drink, because you, can't, you don't sacrifice vegetables. You don't take a broccoli and... <laughs> and there's carrot blood everywhere. Just saying. I know. I'm a guy. You know what I, I think about that. But you sacrifice animals and you, sa and you can offer up wine as a libation offering. It was done in the temple too. We offer up wine to our God. So Daniel is saying, I don't want anything defiled from the king's table. Give me only vegetables to eat. And so it says that, uh, that in verse 11 that Daniel said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, 
Please test your servants for ten days and give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. The guard was afraid that if well, I don't give you what the king and then he's going to be mad at me because I took the best and the brightest and I killed them by not serving them meat and wine. And I have had people say this to me. Rabbi, I, I need, if I don't eat kosher, then I can't get that hamburger that I need and I'm, I won't get the protein. If I just walk in, I just eat. I don't have any kosher restaurants around me. And if I, I'm at work, if I, if I eat only fruits and vegetables, then I'll, I'll, I'll lose my edge. But in verse 12 it says, Please test your servants for ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So there were some young men who said, Yeah, we don't care. Give us unkosher. We don't care. So he agreed to test them for ten days. In verse 15 it says, At the end of ten days they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food so the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. And it goes on to say, to these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. Did you just hear what I said? Because they chose to eat kosher... God empowered them with spiritual and natural understanding. Because they made a choice on what to eat and what not to eat. Let us conclude this series on soul food with that right there. Daniel had courage. Many of us complain, and rightfully so, I've been guilty of myself. Man, I wish I was in Israel where I walk into a store and everything's kosher and there's restaurants everywhere and all of them are kosher. Instead, I've got to pass a hundred restaurants on the way to the kosher market or on the way to Cafe Fino. I'm passing like a thousand pizzerias. We went to the kosher market. I mean, we've seen some idolatry. And Thoreau and his buddies are the only people in the entire kingdom who want to eat kosher, and everybody wants to kill them for it. And we don't want to get in our air conditioned car, put on some Aton cats and drive 75 miles an hour in, our, in our, 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 our leather seat Maserati to the kosher market because it's an hour away. No one's trying to kill us. There's, we're not living in total abject idolatry everywhere we turn around. We're not in Babylon. We're not captives. It takes courage to eat kosher. And maybe it takes more courage to eat kosher when there's nobody making you eat kosher. I hope that Hashem has used this opportunity to teach all of us that every part of our being, body, soul, and spirit, is spirit. And the God of all flesh is also the God of all souls. And He says, I want you to eat soul food because my plan for you is for blessing and for life and joy and honor. Amen. Would you please stand with us as I ask the Hazan to come?